Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming today. I hope uh, what I have to talk about is of interest to you, and I look forward to um, any questions I can answer with, at the conclusion of my presentation. So I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. Okay, so that is an opinion of mine, but I think fitness is fabulous. So <laughs> I'm hoping by the end of this discussion, you can uh, concur with me on that. But um, a little bit of background, I'm a physical therapist. I've been a physical therapist for 25 years. 20 of those I've specialized in working with people with spinal cord injury, um, primarily at Boston Medical Center and then at Spalding Rehab Hospital in the outpatient department. And um, I feel as though physical fitness is a cornerstone of your health and wellness journey when you have a spinal cord injury. And I'm going to hopefully um, explain a little bit more about that here. So the um, objectives of my discussion here, the first one will be to try to explain the importance of exercise when you have a spinal cord injury. Um, it's going to be very simplistic. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail or citing research. It's just really some basic information so that I have time to share resources as well. And then I will talk about some of the benefits of exercise, both emotional and physical benefits. And then finally, just provide some resources for how you can try to incorporate exercise into your life, give you some options. So one little interesting fact I did want to share was that only 50% of people with spinal cord injuries report that they are, um, are participating with exercise which means that 50% of people are not. So we would love to see that number shift towards more people with spinal cord injury participating in some form of exercise. And there are so many more resources now um, with the virtual options. So hopefully some people today will have a better understanding of that. So why should you exercise? Uh, basically, uh, normal everyday activities are just not enough to maintain your fitness when you have a spinal cord injury. Um, in addition, people who have a spinal cord injury are also at uh, are already rather at a higher risk of having cardiovascular disease, and not being active can contribute in a large part to those issues. And then. The final reason I'm sharing is that people with spinal cord injury are more likely than the general population to have health problems that are related to weight gain, changes in cholesterol, and high blood sugar. So those are some concrete physical reasons. Um, and then, you know, just highlighting some of the benefits of exercise. I'm just trying to minimize here so I can see my presentation. So. With exercise, you're, it's proven time and time again that it does help our mood. Um, and I did want to emphasize that exercise can be as simple as doing deep breathing to as complicated as doing a CrossFit training workout. But it can really start with your breath and doing things, just committing to the process and concept of exercise is a wonderful first step and knowing that it can be as simple as working on breathing exercises. And that has shown to improve your mood. This can also help us to sleep better. Um, it improves our energy levels. So then we're more open to different activities and participating more with our family and friends. A big um, benefit of exercise is that it can actually reduce pain, specifically um, neuropathic pain, Exercise has been shown to help manage that, and I know that's a common impairment or people struggle with that. Um, it increases your flexibility in your arms and your legs and your torso, strengthens your muscles, and the trifecta. It helps with weight management, and as I mentioned before, it improves our blood sugar, and it can also have a positive impact on your cholesterol. So those are some of the key benefits of exercise. 
So individuals who have a spinal cord injury that do re exercise regularly have a lower risk of chronic diseases. They also have improved mental health and a better quality of life than those who don't. So that's a really good reason to consider incorporating exercise. No. Oh. Um. Um, one I thing so. I wanted to I, I, highlight. Oh. I'm not going to eat all that. Sorry, I just want to make sure that everybody's put half of it in there. Oh. I'm not sure who isn't. Okay, I think we're okay. Go ahead, Molly. Okay. Um, so just over the past 50 years, really, there's been an enormous amount of growth when it com comes to adaptive fitness options. You know, 40 or 50 years ago, there were really limited options for people who with disabilities to participate in any physical activity, which led to people being more sedentary and not getting involved. And then, you know, the Paralympic events grew and now there's competitive sports teams and adaptive options um, are abundant. Um, and then time and time again, we're seeing as a physical therapist and somebody who is engaged in the adaptive fitness world, just a lot more adapted uh, exercise equipment and ways to use equipment that's not adapted with different devices and special, special gloves. So there are a lot more options now, which is wonderful. And um, there are also gyms that are being more conscientious about making their gyms adapted. Not enough, but it is improving, I would say. There's a trend toward creating a more accessible environment in our local community. So where can you exercise? This is what I wanted to talk about, just some of the main options. And what I wanted to ask people too, is if you have somewhere or you know of somewhere that I haven't listed, it would be great if you could share that in the chat or with Heidi. And then like Heidi said, we're gonna pool the resources so that people can go away and from today and have an idea of where they can participate in exercise if they're interested. Um, one of the programs that's associated with Spalding and that I work with is the EXPD program, which is at Spalding Cambridge in the basement. And that stands for Exercise for People with Disabilities. And then more recently, um, the Y in Peabody, the Teresian Family Y, established a program called Y Adapt. Historically, they had a partnership program that was connected to the Quincy Y, um, but more recently, they at post-COVID, they have evolved their program and identified it as Y Adapt, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. about that. There is a neurorecovery option for um, physical activity for people with spinal cord injuries in Canton, journey forward. Um, I had to include the option of doing things right from your very own home with the Spalding Adaptive Sports Virtual Programming, but there all are also a number of adaptive fitness program um, memberships you can join online, not just through Spalding. Um, and then more locally um, in Charlestown, um, Kathleen will highlight the Spalding Adaptive Fitness options. Uh, Rachel will talk about the options through DCR. And through Spalding Adaptive Fitness, there's also programs on the North Shore um, and on Cape Cod. And then more um, further afield outside of Boston, um, would love to see more in the Worcester area. If anyone knows of any, I would love to hear about those. But there is one in Lancaster I became aware of recently called Adaptex. Um, that's a really wonderful program. I can include some information for Heidi for the website and details. And then another neurorecovery based opportunity is in Stratham, New Hampshire, called Project Walk. This is the flyer for the EXPD program. Um, so, like I mentioned, this is the program that is in the basement at, in Cambridge, at Spalding, Cambridge. And I have a few more slides to highlight this program more in detail that recently has evolved. 
um, and grown quite a bit over the past year. So their mission statement is to provide appropriate exercise to improve the health in those with physical disabilities. And they, I think, were established in 2009 um, with primarily with adapted rowing. So you can see those photos um, that demonstrate that. This is a video that I will let play. And this is the where the program is. This is the room in the basement. So you can see the standing frame, the scale, the wall-mounted ergometers. These are some of the, the exercise physiology staff. A lot of adaptive rowing machines um, with, and it does have the tracking over the top for transfers if you need it. Um, and then it's a really wonderful program. They do a lot of motivating, um, incentivizing for the people that participate in the program. Um, there's a size fit machine. There's um, there's two new steps. There's a new rower called the Hydro Rower that's like the Peloton of rowers. Um, so all of those are um, accessible equipment, and that is in Cambridge, like I mentioned. So this is just another screen that um, will further explain the equipment that they have there. They do have a mile cycle, too. I don't think I mentioned that, which is similar to an FES bike. And the rowing that they do, the adapted rowing, also includes FES, which stands for functional electric spin. So why is um, functional electrical stim rowing such a great option for exercise? Uh, because it will help you to increase your aerobic capacity. It, uh, because it's a weight-bearing exercise, it'll help with your bone density. It'll help reduce your cholesterol. It could help reduce your cholesterol. And like the other benefits of exercise, it can help you sleep. It can help you move better. It can help you to become more independent. Uh, we've seen people who participated report a reduction in their depression, anxiety, their pain, and fatigue. And what's really great about this program is it's in a group setting. There's music. There's um, It's just a really laid-back, informal, but very supportive environment for people to exercise in. Um, it is something that you do need your physician to clear you for, to participate in, and you go through a screening process, but I can talk to you a little bit more about that. It's a nice thing to consider as like a um, you're leaving outpatient therapy and you want, you're not quite ready to join a gym, a more independent style gym. It's, this is just a bit more of a supportive setup. Uh, just a a little bit more to highlight and explain how the adapted rowing works um, and what it is. That's an adapted rowing machine, just a regular concept to rowing machine um, that's adapted with the seat and chest strap so that you can be secure in the in the device. Then there's this piece here that helps to keep your legs from um, moving. And then there's the electrodes that are applied to your quadriceps and your hamstrings. And then there's springs down here, and those will determine how far back your seat goes and how full forward it comes. And the handle here, if you don't have enough grip to hold it, you can use the um, adaptive gloves um, to help maintain your grip. And there's somebody there that helps to facilitate the movement as well. And this is just a short video clip of it in, in person so you can kind of see what I was talking about. This is the FES or the, the STEM machine connected to the leg. This particular person is able to operate the STEM on his own using the thumb switch. But if you're not able to, um, there's a way for the person that's assisting you to do it. Move on to my next slide. Okay, so of course everyone's going to want to know what the cost of the program is. Um, so there is a scholarship program if you're not able to afford it, and that's based on the sliding scale, and that's determined when you do your initial intake. 
Um, but if you are able to afford the program, the, it's, it's set up so that if you go for once a month, $25. If you go two to four times per month, it's $50. Five to seven, 100. And if you go more than eight, it's $150 a month. So this is a nice uh, quote from one of the participants who has been participating in this program for a, a while. And um, Diane said that when she discovered the program, she knew things were gonna be okay, that there is truly nothing like it. And it's a privilege to call it part of her therapy. And we have one other testimonial about the program from Eric. Um, so, oops, sorry. See the top of it, but you can read that. I hope you can see that on your screen. But I just wanted to um, emphasize that for in order to participate in this program, um, people who have quadriplegia levels to 10, just incomplete or complete, but two, four, five um, through down the spine um, can participate because of the modifications that they have. And of course, it's not the case for everybody, but just as a general rule, um, the, pro the, the rolling can be modified so that people are able to participate and it's a really wonderful way to exercise. Okay, so then I wanted to just highlight that Y ADAPT program that's um, now available in, at the Peabody Y. Um, this is a really good program. They have some great equipment that you can see on this brochure. Um, what's really nice about this is that they've been able to get enough funding to offer this to, for free. You just have to join the Y um, and that membership is free. Um, and you can go as often as you want and they have, um, they have trained staff to help you with the equipment. And you can see from the middle um, column that they have quite a bit of equipment. They have the FES bike, the Motomed, which is an arm bike and a leg bike that's um, motorized so that if you're not able to do the movement, the bike will do the movement for you. They have mat tables. They have some accessible strength training equipment. They have a new step, um, just a lot of different options. And they're looking really, they are really looking to grow the program. So that is a really good new resource. And in conclusion, <laughs> I feel like fitness is fabulous, and there, and it it is, seems as though it's not. Um, if it seems as though you have trouble accessing it, I'd love to talk and try to come up with ways that you can access it, even if it means it's from your house or however um, you can start to exercise because the benefits just are tremendous. And like I said, it can be as easy as doing some breathing exercises or as minimal as that as to be really doing intensive exercise on a regular basis. So with that, I'd love to um, take any questions from anybody. I'll stop sharing my screen. I'm gonna just un remove the spotlight so I can see everybody on the screen here. Um, does anybody have any questions for Molly? Joe? Just curious, does insurance pay for any of this? I might have missed that. So um, with if you participate in physical therapy for your exercise, obviously insurance pays for that. Um, but typically with the community program, it's, they do not. But a lot of the programs, as I mentioned, are subsidized, right? So that if they make it affordable, they want to help people to participate as much as possible. And as far as um, one thing I'd like to mention, if you would, did want to use your um, insurance is, and you want to access physical therapy, it can be a great to do an episode of care that involves training for PCA so that then you could continue the program that the therapist prescribed at home. It's a really nice option to consider too. Thank you. Feel free to put something uh, in the chat too, if you. Abby. Hi there. Hi, Molly. Uh, Hi, Abby. 
<laughs> um, this is great. I'm so glad you featured EXPD so um, much in detail because it's truly a wonderful program. It's really uh, very inspiring for, especially for folks um, just starting out post Spalding. Um, and now that I know all these new offerings are there, I'm going to ask if Sam wants to go back. Um, he has a little trouble because he works full time, but um, uh, it's it's great to hear about. One one thing I wanted to ask though is, um, you know, there's always a concern about um, uh, uh, overuse injuries in folks who depend on their uh, upper bodies in whole or in part <laughs> to, um, you know, sort of do the exercise for the rest of the body. Um, putting aside electrostim and machines that actually um, uh, do the the work for you in part. So, can you just speak briefly on the, um, you know, the approach that you recommend to um, balancing upper body um, movement with overall fitness? I'm so glad you asked that, Abby. It's such an important piece to um, living successfully and maintaining your. Um, level of fitness and without overdoing it, right? Um, I will say that the FES rowing or, or the rowing is really a great option for preventing overuse injuries because of the muscles that it targets. They're primarily the muscles on your upper back and in the back of your shoulders, um, which is if you can build the power and the strength there, it helps to prevent overuse injuries, which are typically more in your biceps and in the front of your of your shoulder area. But I do think that it's the best thing to do is if you identify pain or inflammation is to actually get a referral for therapy because the therapist, we can um, assess it and prescribe exercises to help prevent it from getting worse. And just like anything, everything in moderation and listening to your body and knowing, um, pacing your exercise, never starting a, two, a program um, aggressively without really building up your endurance for it and your tolerance to it. Don't start with a lot of weight, but we start with a small amount of weight and build your um, endurance and toning your muscles and things like that. Um, but it is something that you do want to be aware of because that can set you back. So it's really best to identify that early. And if you are finding that um, you're feeling that pain and inflammation to, you know, consider it and not, and stop what you're doing and think about how, what else you can, can be done, right? Because pushing a manual chair, it does require all those muscles to work and overwork. So you have to be conscientious about how you're strengthening the other muscles to prevent it and your form too, and how you're um, maneuvering it, whether or transferring or whatnot, right? Great, thank you. You're welcome. Good question. Thank you. Um, let's see, um, Debeb 2013. Yeah, this is David Biebinger. Sorry, I, I don't oh, have it set hi. up. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, I'm a C6, uh, and um, so which means that uh, I have very limited use of my hands and, and arms, um, but Prior to my accident four years ago, I was, uh, I've always thought that exercise was one of the key pillars of health. So it was very natural for me to try and take up exercise. And, and largely I've chosen to do that on my own. And I, and I did, I have had some experience uh, with the uh, FES rowing in, in Cambridge. And it really is wonderful, particularly for those who uh, need some uh, social interaction. The staff is just wonderful. And um, I, I'm not sure that was highlighted as part of one of the benefits, but I would say uh, for people that do need some social output, that's uh, that is a plug, a plus for it. But um, but I do think the exercise is great. I wanted to just say that a, a means that I've used to increase my exercises by getting my own exercise equipment and so I can do that at home. And I've discovered this system, which is kind of expensive. It's uh, the brand is called Tonal, T-O-N-A-L. So it's it's kind of like a, uh, a Peloton um, for weights. Um, and I don't really use the interactive session because it's all geared for people whose arms and legs work. But, but, um, but I do have someone hook me up to this weight machine 
and they help me to lift weights. And I can do just about any position you can imagine uh, that a normal um, exercise uh, weight machine can do. Um, it's a little bit labor intensive for the person who helps me, but all they do is is adjust the arms and and adjust my gloves and et cetera. Uh, it's not really hard. It's just they have to be there while I do the ex exercise. But, you know, it, the convenience of doing it at home really is wonderful. And that can make uh, exercise a regular pattern where uh, for, I think, most people getting to uh, a location is uh, is uh, a challenge in and of itself um, that may be restrictive of getting exercise uh, performed. So I just thought I'd mention that. And I will say that that I had a big concern about repetitive strain injuries. Um, and, you know, I since I did exercise before, maybe I have been able to adjust better than most. But I think I think trying to push it a little bit with the guidance of someone who's experienced like a physical therapist is probably the best way to go. Um, because if you don't try, then you never know what you can achieve. So um, so I would just make that plug for all of those who are concerned about uh, uh, having side effects from from the exercise. For me personally, uh, you know, an exercise day can be a good day. And there's a rare day where I don't have an exercise day and it's a good day, but everybody's different. So good luck. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Those Dave. Wonderful comments. Really helpful. Thank you so much. Um, the, um, the EXPD program, one of the best pieces to it, as you emphasize, is that social aspect. So if that's something that you feel like you're lacking and you can get there, I, I highly recommend it. So. Um, so we have two questions. So it says Elena, but I, I believe the person's name is Rich, is asking, uh, for a while I wrote a lot, but found... Holding myself upright while I rode caused issues because I have a lot of extensor tone. Any input on more upright rowers? Um, Rich, did you row at the EXPD program or was that something you did on your own? A gym rower. Okay. Um... So they they do have ways to overcome the tone now. They use a compressor in Cambridge, which does help. Because that is a big challenge when you're rowing. If your knees go into extension and you can't come back and complete the cycle, it makes it really difficult. And then you could end up injuring yourself um, and straining your upper body or your back. So um, I think that is something that, you would probably want to either come into the clinic. We actually do have an adapted rower um, in our PT clinic, and I can help review what you're using and try to make any suggestions. It's kind of hard to do in this environment. Or uh, consider um, participating in the EXPD program to get some really good suggestions around what to do. All right, yeah, I, I unmuted. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right, yeah. See, it was one of those... It was a, a typical gym rower. And I found I have a lot of extension tone in my low back. So it was wanting to lie me down flat. So I found myself leaning a lot, which caused some neck issues at herniated disc. And I, I love the rowing aspect, but if I could find something that I wouldn't have to battle so hard or I could hold myself more in a proper posture alignment. Um, yeah, it could make a big difference. So the rowing machines that they have, I don't know if the one you use is modified with a, a high back seat. I know they do have some of the adapted rowers. I'm not sure where you're located, but they do have one at the Quincy Y and at the Hanover Y, the adapted ones with the higher back seat. Uh, but there are other equipments that may meet your needs um, with less of a negative impact on you too. I don't know. Um, but we can probably have a sidebar about that if you want to. I don't want to yeah. keep, keep the um, keep sure. the next speaker needs to come on, but I'd be happy to try to talk to you offline. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, yeah, we'll just go to Steve's question then. I think we'll, uh, and if people have other questions afterwards, please let me know and I can connect you with Molly or, you know, try to 
get some get some uh, answers for you. Um, Steve is asking, can you talk about the benefits of just getting out and pushing your chair for 30 minutes for those who can? Um, yeah, I mean, exercise is exercise, right? You want, like, you want to get your heart rate up. You want to do things that get your endorphins your, and help you to move and, and promote and maintain your independence. You, and if that's what works for you and you have good terrain, that's not going to be too intensive and you can, you know, um, do that without causing overuse. I think that's great exercise, a great exercise option. Um, and it's nice if, too if you can get outside and do that. I know they make, and I don't know if Rachel or Kathleen will talk about some of the adaptive options um, that may be a little less aggressive than just pushing your chair. I know there's different, um, like a freedom chair option and things like that, or um, hand cycles too, that are great ways to just get out and get that cardio exercise. But, you know, if that's what you can do and it works well for you, I'm all for it. It's just a matter of having that balance so you don't overdo it and injure yourself. Thank you so much. Molly, thank you. You're um, thank yes. you for having me. Yes, it's terrific. Great information. And we'll make sure that we get this information out to anybody who um, who wants it and find a place to kind of keep all of these resources. Um, yeah, so I'm going to move to um, Kathleen. And I'm just going to go ahead and spotlight you. I'm coming. I have a few screens open, as you can tell. Let's <laughs> go right here. Thank you, Molly. You, Molly and I are similar in that we both are physical therapists. I feel like we're cousins. We um we really love to straddle that world between the clinic and functional fitness and adaptive sport and recreation. And of course, I know Rachel as well. So this is great. Thank you, Heidi, for pulling us all together. So let me go back. I have a problem with PowerPoint and you know what it is, is that there's too much to say. And I want to just make sure that I show you my highlights. So bear with me here. There we go. Why is it not coming up the way it's supposed to? You guys are seeing my screen, correct? Yes, we see your screen. It's not if you letting hit, me if you hit make it on, on the top. Yeah. Oh, there we go. The okay. There you go. There we go. My brain doesn't like to work on a Saturday. <laughs> so similarly, you know, my role as a PT and as an adaptive sports professional, it has been a journey for me professionally. And I think it's a privilege. It's a, it's a great professional and personal um, combination of bringing together people with various disabilities and helping them recreate. Again, like Molly, my role is to find ways for people to get the memo that fitness and health can be lifelong fun and can be functional. So I kind of know I'm preaching to the choir because you guys all chose to come onto this PowerPoint today and this meeting, but I'm going to show you, I've got about 20 slides I want to share with you. Um, for those of us that don't know us, I'll be using the acronym SASE, Spalding Adaptive Sports Centers. And I have a couple of slides about our general programs, and then I'll show you different sports. I kind of love this slide. I, I, this was probably six years ago. This was at cute little Wachusett, um, where we bring veterans from the Brockton VA. So people that don't get to get out of the Brockton very often and do big trips, um, but they're able to come out and participate in adaptive sports. I sometimes feel there's so much social media around the amazing high-level Paralympians that I have to remind people, the majority of people I'm working with are not Paralympic hopefuls. They're people like me that kind of want to get outdoors. They want to do something fun. They want to be social. They want to be out with their family. So this slide kind of epitomizes that. It's me and one of my recreational therapists. And this is Patricia with her son and grandson who were blown away that after 45 years of living with quadriplegia, she can come skiing with us and she can help a little bit. So again, that slide says a lot. So SASE, as you can see, like our role is kind of bridge that gap between rehab, 
outpatient therapy, and then your lifelong wellness. My team in Boston and in the other locations on Cape and on the North Shore is multidisciplinary. So there's PT, OT, recreational therapists working together to provide so many of these sports. Now, I put my little highlighter on, on the two that seem to be growing the most. That's pickleball and adaptive swimming. Um, I forgot to make an adaptive swim slide. So maybe, Alan, you'll you'll uh, say your piece about swimming. I, I should have put you in this slideshow for something. Um, but we were able to start last winter with adaptive swim in the Charlestown pool. And we're doing some Friday mornings at the Quincy Y. And then the third location we're trying to get into is that Peabody Y. So again, there's we're trying to create a number of different sport opportunities in a number of different locations. And P.S., if you want to stop me as I'm going along and you have a question about a photo, please do. I'll try to make a comment about every photo because I feel like they tell the story really well. Um, so what are adaptive sports? Really a huge range of things that we modify. Could be with cool gear, could be with active hands, a specialized grip. Could be that like in this picture of Becky, in this photo, she's not using our specialized saddle at, um, at Windrush Farm, but we do have a slightly higher back scoopy saddle for someone that doesn't have pelvic and lumbar support. Um, could be different saddles, could be different reins. So adaptive sports itself is a huge range of, of opportunities that we try to make accessible for everybody. Now, that's not to say that every person on this call can do every single sport that's listed here, but we get really good at saying, okay, you're a person that needs to use a ventilator. I'm so sorry, I can't take you on a chairlift anymore, but you are welcome to come to pickleball or basketball. So there are some very real limitations and essential eligibility, um, but most sports can be adapted or modified to make it safe for everybody. Um, this, this overlaps a little bit with what Molly was talking about with EXPD. They do a phenomenal job of really looking at the parameters about exercise and benefits. We don't get to do that. Um, there is a lingering question. What are the physical benefits to adaptive sports? I can tell you they're really similar to exercise. If we're really pushing someone into the zone where they're getting some cardiac from doing a hand cycle, et cetera, there is not enough research about it, but I will show you in the next couple of slides, there are some kind of qualitative surveys, et cetera. Um, and in fact, a little side note, when, my, when I bring my staff down to um, the EXPD room in Spalding, Cambridge, they all want to work there. They all want to leave their job with me. So I, as a rule, try not to bring them there in the first month because seriously, they're like, this is so amazing. Look at what they're doing. We're doing some of this exercise slash sport without having the ability to do as much research and measures of the output. Anecdotally, I can tell you those benefits are very similar. So I do want to mention the very amazing Dr. Sherry Blauet, who's a physician and a researcher and a Paralympian and wears a million hats for Spalding and internationally. Um, she is part of our, our research center that we started years ago, but it's much more in the survey world. So the overarching goal is, yeah, I can tell you the benefits of adaptive sport. My clients tell me this all the time. Um, it's kind of soft research. So she's really trying to get more data points saying, we know this is the impact because we all want to, we expand the offerings and we would love it if one day this is covered by insurance, right? That, that's no surprise. We want to make it more affordable. We want insurance companies to say, wow, this is as powerful as PT in the outpatient clinic. We should pay for this because we know physically there's a benefit. And if you're physically moving, you're less likely to have cardiac weight gain, et cetera. All those amazing things that Molly talked about. Um, so this is just one of many research studies that Dr. Blowett published. What are the benefits? Well, I could tell you this, right? Physical well-being. People feel stronger. 
people were amazed that it wasn't such a high injury thing. Of course, overuse is always in the background, but we manage those risks to try to prevent that and make our participants multi-sport athletes. Of course, people said a huge benefit was socially. I'm with this diverse staff. I'm with other participants. I am learning that someone else has different struggles than I do, and maybe that makes me feel better. Um, I'm building up my own self-confidence. And we all know when you're a little more confident and you have endorphins flowing, you are more likely to keep moving and keep exercising. So there's kind of this upward spiral effect. And of course, access to sport. So when a person has access and they feel good about the mobility, they may make sure they're, they're moving with us year round. So again, I feel like these benefits are not surprising to any of us. And I'm really pleased that there's more and more research coming out every year. So this is what I feel like, you know, it's a little cliche. It's more than a game. It's more than sport. I came into this field 15 years ago thinking about the physical benefits. But in fact, in this particular small survey, let's call it, you know, 13 years ago, the more powerful numbers were confidence, self-esteem, and mood. So if you like to look at numbers and look at this graph, I will tell you, regardless of whether you came once, twice, or 20 times, everybody said my confidence was better, my mood was better, and they were filling this form out in November. This wasn't as they were, they were wheeling out the door, because everybody would say, oh, it's great, it's changing my life. People filled this out way after the fact. Of course, those top four things, the benefits and flexibility, strength, endurance, balance, that is a dose response. If you came every week, you are much more likely to say those things improved. If you came once, you know, you're know you not going to say my strength improved from once. So you know, this slide just reminds me, people come to these programs for a whole bunch of different reasons, and they're all good, right? They're, they're really all good. Um, I'm really glad these questions came up from you guys. Like, what about risk of overuse? Definitely. There's a lot of risks. There's a lot of fears. There's a lot of challenges and barriers. The way we think about it is, gosh, you know, that's our job as PTOT rec therapists is we got to figure out how to make it a safe challenge, right? Like we're part of a hospital. We are not big on, on risk. Um, there have been practices in the past that uh, little by little we have gotten rid of because we just think, gosh, if I said, if I told the head of the hospital that we let a person with a ventilator go on a chairlift and that chairlift stopped and it froze, we would be in huge trouble with the liability. So our roles is to meet each person where they're at. What are your fears? What are your barriers? What are your risks? Let's figure it out. Let's start small. Let's start with cycling. Everybody can ride a cycle, stationary or outdoors. So we manage all that. I do, like I said, some restrictions apply. Ventilators is a great example. Post-seizure, we have to be cautious and put someone on a tandem bike. So there are definitely some restrictions, but fewer than you might believe. So those of us in the healthcare field, working in adaptive sport, we really all believe the risk of being sedentary is way bigger than the risks of doing these things. Um, so let's look at the sports. Um, we have a fleet of, gosh, I'm going to say 40 bicycles at any given time. 10 of them are in the shop trying to get fixed. Hand cycles, leg cycles, all of them are three-wheeled, nice and low to the ground for the most part to make transfers reasonable. And we keep them moving year round. So that's at Spalding, Cambridge, in Sandwich at the hospital, and in Charlestown at the hospital. So if I set this up right, I can show you Kim. Oh, that's really loud. So there's Ken. And boy, uh, Ken was a multi-sport athlete before and after his spinal cord injury. His level of injury was complete at C5-6. In fact, he was ski patrol. He did get back to skiing with me, uh, sit skiing on a tether. But you can see in that with hand cycling, it's not a reciprocal crank. When you're sitting in OT or at a gym, it is a reciprocal. Because of the steering column, when we hand cycle, you've got to do simultaneous crank. 
what you can see on Ken here is a very commonly used active hand. So it's a Velcro wrist wrap, goes around the wrist, it's got a little pull tab. It's perfectly safe. We use it all the time. A lot of people buy them so they can go to the gym. I can use them skiing. I can use them in every sport except for kayaking. Because if I Velcro your hand to a paddle and you go over, which is highly unlikely, we don't have a lot of tipping, thank God. It's extremely rare. I do not want you affixed and a risk of entrapment to be attached to the paddle. But anyway, we can use, that's one example of the wrist adaptations we can use. Um, so, you know, it's run like a spin class. We have music, we have young staff. We try to make it fun and motivating. The spin classes are an hour long. Of course, it's not an hour of cardio. Five, 10 minutes of setup and changing the boom length and, you know, getting you situated before we try to get in a 45 minute spin class. Um, I kind of love this slide because it shows the range. We've got Vinny on the left. I don't like that he's not wearing a helmet. So you know that was at his house, not at my program. But he created a hand cycle for himself from lots of different bits and pieces he had in his garage. So he could go hand cycling with his daughter. That was a great goal. And then on the right is more long. Um, uh, it's a long weekend that we do in October on Martha's Vineyard where people cycle anywhere from 24 to 40 miles a day on Saturday and Sunday. It is a huge challenge. Not everybody makes that that whole mile, but again, the range of challenges that are different for everybody according to their needs. Mountain biking is spectacular. It is happening only on Cape Cod. And as these pictures show you, they're not climbing mountains. This is the Cape. So they are fairly flat. Um, every Saturday, Terry Downey, a spectacular PT who really loves this sport, is getting people out on our growing fleet. To our knowledge, this is the only adaptive mountain bike program, program in Massachusetts at this point. Um, Rachel may prove me wrong and we hope that grows because there's definitely an interest in it. And there's a little bit happening in Vermont and New Hampshire, of course. Target sports are led by the amazing Jennifer Packard, an OT colleague and friend who started this program. So that middle photo, I don't remember this particular gentleman's name, but I do remember that he needed to use sip and puff technology to access the air rifle. And this is indoors at Woburn. It is amazing, highly adaptable to participate in archery in the summer and air rifle and archery in the winter. Rock climbing, we contract with Waypoint Adventure. We are not rock climbing experts and we are so happy to partner with other organizations that do the sports that we don't have in our, in our tool belt. So we support them, we work with them, we send them clients. Um, I love this photo because that's Tom. He has been a paraplegic, gosh, I'm gonna say 30, 40 years. And at one point he's like, well, I wanna volunteer. Why can't, why can't I belay? Rock climbing is phenomenally accessible for all. On the right is that same gentleman, Ken, who is hand cycling. And he is not able to access the rock face with his hands and knees. So he just uses this adaptation doing mini pull-ups to ascend the wall parallel to the wall. This is in the Quincy Quarries and that place is spectacular. The upper left photo is one of our clients who presents with something like incomplete uh, paraplegia. So she does have a little bit of mobility in her hips. She is able to access the wall, but she's got knee pads on because of course we're, we're cognizant of skin sensitivity and, and, and lack thereof. So um, do not fear rock climbing. There's lots of ways that sport can happen. Pickleball, I should have put a pickleball picture in there. Monday nights, we just started our first ever relationship with the Charlestown Y. And we are doing pickleball in their huge gym in the basement. Last Monday, we had three people in power chairs, three in court sports and three standing up. And it was fairly chaotic, but we figured it out and we split the gym like this half is basketball, this half is pickleball. And there is a distinct advantage to my power chair users. 
but we make it work. And we had a few folks using their hand on the joystick and trying to figure out, well, gosh, my non-dominant hand, what if I use that active hand and I hold the pickleball paddle? Does that work out? So we modified and we made it inclusive. So in pickleball, I can have one person standing and one sitting, or I can have three people on a side to play pickleball, which is on a nice small court. But again, do not rule out your ability to participate in the court sport chairs if you're a power chair user. We do travel with these court sport chairs for people that would like to give that a try. Ski and ride club, before you know it, it's going to be January and we're going to be out on the hills. Um, I manage the, the ski club, the ski and ride club. We will be every Thursday in Wachusett until the snow melts right around St. Patrick's Day. We have a lot of sit skiers. We travel with a trailer. We have here, you're looking at bi skis. What is truly amazing is in that lower picture, it's called a Tetra ski. We don't own one because it would fill up half of my trailer and it's still in research and design, but it did come out of a rehab center out in U Utah. This can be used with either a sip and puff or a joystick where one of the skis comes up on edge and allows the participant, typically someone with quadriplegia, to by and large be steering that by ski. You see one little tether cord coming from behind that is, of course, steered a little bit by the, the coach, but that is a very almost independent piece of ski equipment. Mono skiing is typically for someone who has paraplegia and is able to use the majority of their muscles and shoulders and forearms to use those outriggers to steer and balance. This is a much harder sport. I find it extremely difficult. I would never want to be a mono skier. Put me in a two skis underneath any day and I have my full core. What's interesting about adaptive skiing in Alpine world is there are international rules and regulations that we all live and die by for our certification. I'm not gonna talk about this because I know Rachel will, but I kind of love this slide and I love that we have this partnership in East Boston. So I'll let her rave about this, this really cool program that starts in December this year, I believe. Uh, we do have a sled hockey team and a recreational time every Sunday in Everett. It is still free. Thank you to Edna Sears. Um, uh, most of our sports are pretty low budget, but free is free. So sign up and, you know, give it a try. Upper left, you can see my PT friend, Sean. He's using the push bar for someone that's not able to both push with the short sticks and shoot the puck. I do need to talk about virtual programs. Guess what? No surprise, started during the pandemic um, and we can't get rid of it because people love virtual so much. For many people, it's all they do. For other people, it's how they work out during the week because they don't get a chance to do the other sports. So the um, yoga is free thanks to a grant, but many of the, the groups are really 10 bucks a class upper body pump, you name it. The instructors are very good at modifying so everybody can participate. And then there is what's called inclusive fitness training. So if you want to pay a little more and you want a one-on-one -on -one athletic trainer while you're at home, great, we got you. That's an offering. We also do a little bit of in-person inclusive fitness training, not yet in Peabody, but hopefully we will, not different than what the Peabody Y is doing. And we will be doing that at the Quincy Y most Fridays, as long as my staff can do that. Um, the last big virtual program that we're proud of and we're super excited. Well, now it's not letting me advance. It's as if I don't know how to use Zoom. Um, mentor. This is another program that came to us during the pandemic. We were invited. It was a CDC grant for the first year when I was a coach. And now we have a five-year grant. We are one of six rehab centers in the country. Of course, Craig in Denver is another site. And with this grant, we have a full-time recreation therapist, the amazing Haley Kerwin-Brown. And she runs eight-week free groups, small groups, six to eight people, three hours a week, you're with Haley and she's coaching you. What are your goals? 
you're done with rehab, you do a little adaptive, but you're at a point you need a boost. Could be after you had an overuse injury or a setback. So you are on Zoom three hours a week doing exercises, one hour a week doing mindfulness with the CDC person, and one hour a week doing nutrition. So it's about five hours a week. It is really individualized, very small group. And what happens after that eight week is many of those cohorts continue to work out or coach one another informally. It's an incredible model that we really hope takes, you know, takes a life of its own after the five-year grant is over. I bring this up because I believe in it so, so much. It's what we do, but on an eight-week scale that gives folks a boost. And Haley will be starting another group in the middle of January. So she will run those eight weeks, start another three groups in March or April, and it runs year round. Now, my question to her was, what if today or you know next month, a handful of folks say they, they want to do this together or, you know, there is a group of people, especially if it's a group that clients all have quadriplegia, she would love to put that like-minded cohort together. That is always what she does. If she has 10 people that are all stroke sur survivors and they can all do Monday at noon, she is going to make her mentor cohort for that eight weeks similar in their impairments and more importantly in their abilities what they can do so she's completely open to that possibility we've tried it before and we'd really like that to happen this is my last slide uh, you can see that you know you do need to register of course you do need to create a profile we try to make it user friendly it's a website it's not perfect so there is a phone number and there is um, an email that you can reach out to to get a little support with either creating that profile, remembering your password, or requesting the activities. We try to do a one to two week turnaround. So if you request, I want to come the meeting. to the no video. class, um, I show? will approve a week at a time. So if you say, can I come to spin class Christmas week? Too far out. I can't answer that question yet. So it's about a week at a time. And I will say, currently, we've only got November, December on our website. We didn't yet do January or February. Ski Club will be up there come December 1st. It is too overwhelming to look four months ahead. I know other people like to. We can't pull that off. So we ask you to be patient and uh, keep an eye on the website and really just reach out to us individually if that's useful. So I'll stop there. And I'm so sorry for the tech difficulties, but you know, I think you saw my favorite slides. No, it was great. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Kathleen, do you have, do we have a couple of minutes for any questions? Oh, absolutely. Are you able to do that? Absolutely, okay. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Anyone have any questions for Kathleen? Who's going to come skiing with me this winter? Um, Joe, you have something? Joe and then Ed. Yeah, just a couple um, uh, comments. Uh, you outsourced to Wisconsin. Um, just kidding. I, I didn't but, hear what you um, said. Oh, you outsourced to Wisconsin. There are some really good adaptive sport agencies in Wisconsin. You just don't have a lot of Alpine. Yeah. Yeah, you could do cross uh, country. True. You could do. Um, sit. Yeah. One of my comments was that I was part of the first mentor program that came through with Haley. And uh, we do still have a group that she's set up and we meet three times a week to do exercises. So, um, so that does work. And um, we've been doing that ever since. We're way over a year out because some of us were part of the alumni part of, of mentor, but that's kind of fallen by the wayside, unfortunately. Well, and I think what's what's new, I don't know, Joe, if you were part of this, you continue to have access to that healthy website, that healthy portal, where you can track your workouts and goals individually. And, and that's lifelong for free, I believe. Right. Yep. I do have that access, but I didn't know you, we could track our exercise. So that's good to know. Thank you. I think so. Did any, I, oh, um, Ed, did you have a question? 
Ed Newell. So uh, Kathleen was uh, asking who was going to join her skiing program this year. And uh, this will be my first, wi first winter, Kathleen, since my injury. Uh, so I'm not sure how I'm going to manage the cold weather. Uh, I know just in the change of seasons here, uh, the cold is, is affecting me in a detrimental way with, you know, spasticity and uh, keeping my extremities warm, and staying warm, not letting myself get cold. My, uh, my old self had a, a real high tolerance to the cold. And now I, I just don't know how I'm going to manage things this winter. I think I might have to wait a year and uh, catch up with you next winter because it's definitely on my to-do list to, to, uh, to learn how to ski again. Well, and um, you brought up something I should have mentioned for restrictions. For most people after spinal cord injury and spinal stabilization, your physician that did the spinal surgery is going to say, wait a year. That's kind of best practice. Even though I say we're not going down moguls, the majority of my folks are starting at the bottom of the mountain. We're not even talking chairlift yet. So you're low and slow, but there is, that is the general practice is your doc. You know, sometimes they'll tell me it's okay after six or nine months, but there is a very real burial that nobody wants that stabilization to, to be problematic. Um, as far as cold management, you are spot on. Like that is a really tough thing to get those active hands on with cold fingers to go around the outrigger. We're using hand warmers over thin gloves because I don't want to burn your skin. We are using every, there's now some really nice gloves that you can put it right behind here to keep you warm. I'm putting them on your back. I'm putting them on your chest. I'm making sure your feet are warm. In a sit ski, I can wrap like a thick blanket. We have these things that we can put over your lower body in a sit ski to keep your lower body warm. And then pretty quickly, your upper body is going to get warm because you're using shoulders. So it's, it's a real consideration, but there are ways around it. A lot of people are going to start in Wachusett because you don't have altitude. You're not going high up and it's not as cold as going up to Sunapee or something. Um, and then we're, we're there in the middle of the day. We're doing 10 to two. So we're not getting, we're not getting outdoors at eight or nine in the morning. So it's better for your schedule and it's not as cold. And then you do two runs and you go inside. So, you know, you'll have two or three coaches with you. Nobody minds if you take two runs and go in. You just, you know, it's, so it's your expectations you're going to figure out. Yeah. So no, no first turns in, in the fresh powder then, huh? Not the first <laughs> run. You know, like when you were a kid, was your first run in the powder on the yeah. moguls? Mine was not. Mine was like, <laughs> you know. Uh, awesome. Thank you. So I, I just want to be mindful of the time. I know that Kathleen does need to head out and we want to hear from Rachel. Um, Jules, did you have something quickly? I do very quickly. Kathleen, it's so very nice to meet you. I didn't quite make a connection between mentor and the healthy. I'm also a graduate of mentor and growth and had the great opportunity to go <laughs> My first MS fall in 2006 was when I was what I call vertical skiing in Lake Tahoe. And then in 2017, to be able to go bucket skiing, whatever you call it, with a dual blade in Aspen, Colorado, it was amazing. So do you ever up there, Heidi, at all, do you ever let somebody who's, you know, redneck from the South, join y'all in anything up there? Because I'd sure fly up there in a heartbeat if, if you would. It's a great point. You don't have to have anything to do with Spalding to come hang out. And, and same with Molly. Like you don't need to be a Spalding rehab grad or does not at all matter. You want to try it, you do it. And Jules, I should tell you, my lucky colleague, Kasia, does adventure travel. She's doing two trips this year, one to Utah in March and one to Steamboat Springs in February. The one to Steamboat Springs is, is, is Springs is called STARS. It's only for people with spinal cord injury. So with these grant funded programs, usually you pay for the airfare and the vast majority of the rest of it is covered. So that'll be on the website December 1st. 
I don't get to go, but you could. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It's pretty cool. And I got to say, Jerry, I'm sorry I didn't do a golf slide. <laughs> I'm super sorry. It's not because we're not going back to the super stores in Peabody and Quincy. It's that I don't think about it in the winter. We don't get to bring the solo rider, their para golfer, into the simulator stores. We still own them. We still dust them off. Not in the winter. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, it looks like uh, Rich will be looking forward to skiing. Um, Steve in Worcester, uh, he's, he, you're on his list as well. So awesome. very exciting. Kathleen, thank you thank so Thank you guys much. so much. Amazing. And again, if people have more questions or need more information, we can connect you with Kathleen or with the program. Um, and I'm just looking to see Abby, um, can Molly or Kathleen speak informally to the cost benefits of the journey forward program for folks with SCI of different sorts, complete versus incomplete, C versus T, Spalding and patient case managers frequently recommend looking into it, but it can be expensive and hard to get to. Um, this, I just want to, again, we, we are, we are supposed to end at 1230 and we haven't, I want to give um, our time to Rachel, but maybe that's a, is that a quick Thing that can be answered. I don't know if it is. I don't think it's quick. I think yeah. they can do some amazing work. And then there are also, you know, they don't have PTOT on staff. So sometimes the bang for the buck feels a little uneven depending on the client and their abilities and needs. And other people are doing similar things. Like some of the YMCAs, I think, are trying to do similar things at an affordable rate. Mm -hmm. So all over the place. But I think Molly probably knows it more. Yeah, and Molly, if you want to put, oh, go ahead, Molly. Yeah, what I'll do is I'll try to answer that in the chat for everybody to review because that is a really good question and I'm glad that you brought it up, Abby, and I have some insight. So I'll just answer that in the chat and let Rachel get going, okay? Thank you so much. Thank you, Abby. I'm sorry. I wish we had we had more time for that because it, it is a great question. Um, yeah, thank you, Molly and, um, and Kathleen for addressing that. Um, so Rachel, you are up. Great. And so um, thinking of time, is it I'm happy I will sit here all day talking about uh, the parks so I can go long or I can yeah. cut things short to try and end. Okay. That's I, fine. That's fine. If people want to stay for a little bit longer, that's absolutely fine with me. Yeah. Great. Spotlight you. All right. I'm going to try and share my screen. And is that working? Yes. All right. Great. So I'm, um, I'm Rachel, and I'm with the DCR's Universal Access Program. And so I'm going to be talking about the accessible recreation opportunities in the state park system here in Massachusetts. And I'll be I'm mentioning a couple of things that have already come up. Uh, we work with Spalding on something. So Kathleen has mentioned um, some places like the downhill skiing is actually at a DCR property, uh, Wachusett State Mountain. So there's, there's lots of overlap here. And... So DCR is an acronym, which we seem to really like in state government, um, and it stands for the Department of Conservation and Recreation. And what that is, is it's the state parks department here in Massachusetts. So um, there's state parks, forests, pools, and rinks. That's about 450,000 acres. There's a lot of state land here in Massachusetts. And the Universal Access Program, and our acronym is UAP, um, we are part of the Parks Department that are looking to make sure that all that public land is available for everybody to access. And so we, we do that in a couple ways. We work on site improvements, doing things like making accessible campsites, working on our buildings. And then we also run adaptive rec programs and have adaptive rec equipment available in the state parks across the state. And so the goal is we always, not every single place is necessarily accessible, not every single activity, but we try to have it that you don't have to travel too far to find something accessible in your local area, um, something you can do. And so this map is just showing some of the stuff. It's actually, there's even more now, we need to update it. Um, just showing the fact that it's scattered um, all around the place. So today I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna focus more on the winter stuff that we're doing since winter's going on right now, but I will I'll also talk a little bit about some of the things in the summer too that you can look forward to. So the adaptive rec programs, um, there's a lot of 
of overlap what Kathleen was talking about, about the types of equipment we have and the way we modify it. So we have we have the equipment, we make the modifications, um, fit it to you so that it's comfortable. I don't need to worry about skin breakdown, make sure you're really fitted to the gear and the effort you're putting in is getting translated into moving or doing the activity. And so there's staff instruction and support at the programs too. So we help ranges of folks, you know, if you've never done this activity before, you're welcome to come and we'll walk you through it. You can give it a try. You can kind of build up your skill level, try different things. Or if it's something that you haven't done since your injury um, and want to get out and try in a new way, all levels are welcome. Um, and so on this slide, I'm showing off a couple of the things. Um, that's actually a Tetra ski up in the top right there that Kathleen mentioned. Um, we use it for cross-country skiing at our programs. We don't we don't go downhill, we stay relatively flat. Um, and then in the bottom, the bottom's got some summer stuff uh, showing there's a gentleman gonna transfer into a canoe that has a seat in it. And so usually the canoes are just sitting flat, but we have a seat that'll give you back and lateral support so for a little more support. And then another gentleman getting um, instruction on paddling in a double seater kayak. So the hair, you have somebody, two people are paddling and you can see he's used, he's dropped off his chair on the beach mat that's gotten him right down to the water. It's just a little snapshot of the programs. We partner with a lot of people to run our programs, a lot of different organizations. Um, Spalding's right up there. And Kathleen mentioned we'll be de, um, skating in East Boston starting next month. So that one's always a lot of fun. And sometimes we um, were contracting them to run programs or we'll run them together sort of in a partnership like our, our East Boston program. And right now our partners are Spalding, Holyoke Rose, Waypoint Adventure, Easter Seals, and All Out Adventures. And we also work with organizations, other organizations to support them that might be running their own programs in the state parks system. So sometimes help with logistics of setting up schedules, um, getting a portable toilet if it's way out in the woods, something like that. So now I'm gonna focus on the winter programs. So in the winter, we've got indoor ice skating and then outdoor programs. Oops. I'll scroll back. Um, yeah, indoor ice skating and then outdoor programs. And we also, um, some supported programs that we're not running, but we do support are the, like the da downhill skiing at Wachusett that Kathleen mentions and the, um, the sled hockey as well. Sled hockey, Spalding sled hockey is taking place in um, the veterans rink in Everett, which is a DCR managed rink. But for us, the programs we're running, um, it's indoors and, and outdoors. And this slide is showing a couple of things that we do. There's uh, that cross country, Skiing, there's a tiny little bit of a hill here, but it still is cross country up on the up on the right. You've got somebody, a stand skier and a sit skier side by side. Um, some folks using one of our outdoor rinks at a skating program and then kick sledding down the hill. It's just a lot of fun too. I'll talk a little bit more about kick sleds in a minute. The adaptive ice skating program is a program where you're coming, we have the, we reserve basically the whole ice at one of the state ranks. So it's just for us. We shave part of it so that it's less slippery. There's sort of more traction. And then we get out and play on the ice for a couple hours. Um, there's a bunch of types of equipment, um, a mix. You can see in this picture, some folks are stand skating. Some folks are sit skating. Got somebody in a power chair. So it's a, a place where sort of everyone comes together on the ice and just sort of has a good time. Um, you can do sort of the traditional around the rink skating if you're looking to get an exercise or practice skating, or you can kind of break out in the middle and um, play with all the gear we have. We've got balls, we've got pucks, we've got uh, blocks that we stack up. So it's a, one of my favorite programs because everyone's out there sort of hanging out together and having a good time. Um, we have all the equipment, just like all our programs, we bring it, we'll make modifications, adaptations, um, so it works for you. And then, um, and there's no cost for these programs. They're, they're, they are free. I'm gonna, I'm looking a little bit more at those ice sleds. So Kathleen talked about them um, in the context of hockey. I'm gonna talk about them in the context of our program. They're the same type of sled, but ours are set up to be a little more stable than, than most hockey players are, are gonna have their sleds. So there's a, it's just like if you're stand skating on two blades on your feet, these just have the blades under the sled. And there's um, there's different types we have to for different types of skating or to work for different things that work for different folks. 
So in the top left, you can see these two, these two girls are racing in some sleds that they're moving themselves. So if you've got good upper body strength and trunk control, you can push yourself across the ice by using those little hockey sticks with picks on the end of them, and you're pushing to move yourself across the ice. And these sleds that they have, um, they also have outriggers on them, those little bars that are sticking out on the side that make them extra stable. So there's extra stability on turns. Um, you don't need to worry about tipping over. And our sleds all also have anti-tippers in the back too to stop from just a little bit of extra to keep you from tipping over in the back. And then below that, you've got um, you've got a girl in a sled uh, that's got a handle in it. So this one can be pushed. There's a little more back support. It's higher up. We've put some foam wedges in there to get her wrapped and snug and bands to keep it tight. And then um, the Ed and Kathleen were talking about the cold too. It is it is chilly in the rinks um, and you're close to the ice when you're in one of these ice sleds. So we have blankets and it's pretty common to sort of bundle up and wrap in there to, to keep yourself warm. Um, and then there on over on the right here is showing a sort of our biggest deluxe model of a sled with a really big bucket seat. So you've got a lot of back support sides that wrap in they're they're padded they're pretty comfortable um this one also has handles on it so that um it can be pushed um, if you or the doll in this case um want some assistance or aren't moving yourself it can still scoot across the ice we also have skate walkers so these are for folks who are standing and they're a balance aid that glides on the ice and we can modify and adapt those too um one of the things we do is we have these forearm grips that rest on top. Usually folks are gripping the skate walker, as you can see on the left there, sort of gripping with your hands and holding it. If it's the, if you, uh, sorry. <laughs> the, um, the problem with that is of course, it, it gets kind of tiring, you're pushing down. So we can adapt it to have things like the these rests where you can rest your forearms out in front of you and just grip the the, the handles at the end to give yourself that support. And folks use these, you can use them whether you're skating on stand skates or walking on the ice. We actually, um, you don't even have to put skates on to come out and enjoy the ice at our programs. Because you also have these ice grippers. These, they slip on over your shoes. You don't have the height of the skates or the tippiness being on those narrow blades, but you can still get out and walk around and enjoy all the, the fun and games that we're having out there. And this uh, this is a picture showing Matt, our equipment specialist, helping helping somebody get one of those on their shoes before they come out on the ice. Um, they're really nice to have around the home too. After our programs, I went and got some because um, they really help with slipping and with preventing slipping in the the winter when you're walking around. They're they're very useful to have. And you can just come out on the ice um, in common what you got. I see that Kathleen and I used the same picture here of our group of power chair guys playing power chair ball, um, which is always fun. But that's, you can come in your manual chair, um, you can get pushed in your manual chair, if you've got a rollator, power chair, all, all sorts of stuff. You can just come out on the ice and whatever works for you um, and have some fun. So the places we're skating this year are in East Boston. Um, like I said, that starts next month, that's with Spalding um, in December. We'll also be in Brockton, Fall River, Worcester, and then further out west in Holyoke, Gardner, and North Adams. And there's a pre-registration process, um, pretty simple one. You can see their full schedule and all the details on dates and times and how to sign up um, at mass.gov slash UAP schedule. And I'll give a link at the end too. You don't have to worry about writing it down, but in case you want to do it, there it is. There's also the outdoor stuff we do in the winter. So there's that indoor skating. And then if you're going outdoors, there's cross country skiing. Uh, we don't do the downhill. We don't have any downhill programs, but we do have cross country. And then snowshoeing, kick sledding, or outdoor ice skating. The program at Leo J. Martin Ski Track in Weston is really nice because they make snow there. So these programs start up in January when there's hopefully snow, but we've been having some iffy winters lately. So at Weston, they make the snow. As long as it's cold enough, we've got snow to work with. If there isn't snow, we'll turn the program into sort of a hiking program. So these are a little bit further west at um, Dunn State Park and Gardner, 
Wendell State Forest in Wendell or DAR State Forest in Goshen. Uh, if we have snow, we use the snow, and if not, we'll go on hikes. And in this picture, you can see um, there's a kick sled user, and this is at Weston Ski Track, uh, sorry, Leo J. Martin Ski Track in Weston, where you can see there's a nice snow where they're using it, and then behind them is grass. And here are some of the fancy things we use when we're going outdoors. So it's it's really similar as Kathleen was talking to downhill. Um, we only have the bi skis that you're sitting in because we're doing cross country. We don't have any of those nifty mono skis um, because you're just kind of you need to be able to push yourself. You're generating the force because you're not going downhills. There's a couple different types, a couple different setups um, depending on you know what works for you. We'll modify it. So on the left here, we've got um, got somebody using a sit ski that's got a nice long straight leg, so you don't have to have your knees bent. And there's a handle to get um, an assist while you're going up or down the hills and uh, ropes too, if you need to be pulled. So there's a crew here that's helping her get out and, and use the snow. And then down on the bottom right, there's somebody again using that Tetra ski who's skiing on their own. So using the two ski poles to push um, and there's a little bit more of a bent, bent knee angle, net bent knee angle on this type of ski. There's also uh, we have a. I know I said two skis, but there's one hippocamp wheelchair that gets modified that actually has three, three little skis. That's another option where again you can be pushed by a handle or assist or push yourself with these poles. And if you're if you're standing up, there are things like the um, the ski walker that gives balance while you're skiing or or cross country or uh, sorry or snowshoeing as well it's balance support while you're you're going through the woods and then the bottom left here is um Dinny again she was on the first slide using a kick sled down a hill and a kick sled is it's a Scandinavian thing where you've got a chair on the front and then these long runners in back so again you the person sitting in front you can be pushing yourself with these ski poles get an assist in the back and then if there's ever there's sort of any type of hill or you pick up some speed, the person behind you can actually hop on those runners and go with you. So you're kind of sledding down the hill and they're do, they'll do the steering as well. So it's, it's a lot of fun. The equipment that I had mentioned at the beginning, um, all the ice sleds that we're using at the programs, you can also go on your own to a rink and use them. We've got them at a couple dozen rinks all across the state, um, a lot of them in the Boston area. This map is showing uh, showing where we have them. And I can't show all the ones in Boston because they're so clustered. And the, um, the way to use those is you just get in touch with the rink, contact the rink. You can use them during public skating. There's no charge to use them. Um, there's no charge for public skating at some DCR rinks, but other ones, they're state rinks, but they're managed by another company. So um, there might be a fee. I can't remember. I think there is. It's a pretty pretty low fee. So if you get in touch with the rink, um, they can let you know what type they have, you know, how big it is, how many handles they have. You can figure out if it's going to work for you. And you can, there's a list of all those rinks on our website. You can also always get in touch with us directly. If you try and find a place near you that has the stuff or you have any questions, um, let us know and we can help you make that connection too. So that was the winter stuff. Summer, I'm just gonna kind of breeze through because otherwise I'd be here talking for hours. Um, so we do the rec the winter season is November through March. And then sort of our typical summer program is June through August, but we also do shoulder stuff in the spring and the fall and like May and September and October. And in those we have um, hiking, cycling, paddling, that's uh, canoeing and kayaking. There's outdoor rowing. Um, Molly was talking about indoor rowing. You can also take that outdoors on the water. Uh, sailing, swimming, and I I'll show some of the golf carts that Kathleen didn't end up showing. Um, and these are just like the indoor programs. We're making the modifications. A lot of the things that Kathleen talked about, again, we're just taking it outdoors. We've got hand grips for the hand cycles. We've got different types of pedals for the recumbent cycles. We have some interesting recumbent tandems where two people are using it. And if you're in the rear seat, you don't need to be pedaling at all. You can sort of get a passive workout of your legs moving, or you can um, assist in the pedaling with special 
um, the paddles will, will stay on your feet the way the hand grips it can be modified to stay on your hands. And this picture is showing some of the hikes. Um, the one of the recumbent tandems that we have, a bunch of the tandem kayaks. Those are two people paddling. Um, a tandem. We do tandem rowing as well, and then somebody using one of the the pair of golfers on the golf course. There's golf equipment as part of our golf programs in the summer, and then also to use on your own, like the ice sleds at the rinks. You can come back and and use them on your own at both of the golf courses that DCR has. So that's the Leo J. Martin course in Weston and Ponkapog and Canton. And we have the solo rider and the pair golfer. The solo rider's on the left there. It's more like a traditional golf cart, but there's hand controls and the seat in back pivots you can see in this picture. So you can swing right from your seat. And then there's the pair golfer, which is very fancy. Um, it's a power wheelchair designed for golf. So you transfer into the chair, go around the course, and then when you're ready to swing, it lifts you up into that standing position so you can swing. And this is uh, this is a picture of Steve Kuketz who runs the programs and manages the orientation. So when you come to use the the paragolfer, paragolfer, he'll work with you to figure out you know how to use it, what types of adaptations you need, um, and then you can be set up to come back and off on your own. There's also beach wheelchairs to take on your own. Um, we've got two types, the floating type and the sand type. They're spread across the state. There's about 16 in the Boston area. And these, um, these you do need someone to push you in the sand because there isn't a way to move those big tires by your hand, but by yourself by hand, uh, but it'll get you into the water or out on the beach close to the water. There's also beaches and pools that are accessible. Um, beach mat and beach ramps gets you down to as close to the water as possible. And all of the state managed pools have lifts and most of them also have ramps as well to get into the water. You can see a list of those at mass.gov slash beach access. And here I'm showing a, a ramp leading down to the water at Harold Parker State Forest up in Andover, some beach mat at Demarest Lloyd down in Buzzards Bay, and then one of our lifts and a ramp into the pool. There's also accessible camping opportunities if you wanna go out and camp on your own. So these, at 19 of our campgrounds, we have sites that we've improved for accessibility to make sure they're flat and firm. Um, and those are at all different types. We've got cabins, yurts, and then RV sites and tent sites. And there's they're spread throughout whatever the campground they're in, the, the, they're marked which sites are accessible, and they're always in the same loop as an accessible comfort station, but the route to the comfort station might be on the road, so you might need to drive there. Um, there might not be an accessible pedestrian route, but there's always drivability and parking to get to the comfort station while you're camping. And there's plenty of other things to do in the parks too. Um, we've got accessible trails, there's accessible fishing platforms, um, accessible hunting opportunities. A lot of the DCR interpretive programs, those are accessible or can be made accessible if you need an accommodation, um, some type of interpretation. So you can find out about all of the other things, all of the accessible things in the state parks at our website, which is mass.gov slash DCR slash access. So if you wanna stay connected and find out what's going on, um, if you've got questions, if there's a park near you that you know, about that you're going to and you want to find out what more you can do if you want to find out what's in your area the best way to do that is to get on our mailing list and, or reach out and ask us some questions you can do that at our website again mass.gov slash dcr slash access you can send us an email at dcr.universalaccess at mass.gov or give us a call i'm also putting my email address on there if you've got any specific questions about things that came up today um, or just want to reach out, I'm always happy to talk about the parks. So that's rachel.lee at mass.gov. Um, and this is a picture of the UAP team. There's six of us. And you may know Tom McCarthy, um, I think comes to this group sometimes. He's our, he founded the Universal Access Program almost 30 years ago now. It was in 95. Um, so this is all of us out in the parks um, having a good time and hopefully you'll join us. All right, and I think that's it.
Awesome. Thank you so much, Rachel. I just, um, I know that we're a little over time and if people need to drop off, we certainly understand. But um, Rachel said she does have a few minutes if anybody has any questions um, for Rachel about the programs she talked about. Jerry, you have something? Jerry and then Ed. Yes, Rachel, um, I'm part of Golf for All, and, you know, I um, I was the one that helped Tom McCarthy get the para golfers and the solo rider at the two golf courses. I'm just wondering why Golf for All is not mentioned. I mean, I know we do adults with autism clinics up at Leo Martin, and I've been teaching disabled golf for 15 years, so um, we also can teach the disabled, any disability how to golf again. So I'd like it if you could include golf for all um, in your presentation, please. Oh yeah, thanks, Jerry. Um, the focus on winter now, I, I didn't include all of our summer partners. So in on the golf page in the summer, we list golf for all as a, as a partner, but I did, that's a good reminder. I should have everybody on the slide and not just not just the winter folks. So thanks. And thanks for help those help getting those pair of golfers. They really are fantastic pieces of equipment. Um, and I'm not a golfer myself, but I know folks really enjoy them. So thanks. Well, let me just tell you the quick story. They were opening up nine holes at Parker Pod. Tom McCarthy and all the higher ups went out there and they asked me and they asked an APT to hit the ball. So I crushed two balls and Tom McCarthy said, we're going to get four of those machines. And I said, wait a minute. I work out of the Spalding with the chapter, and I don't think I can put that many asses, paralyzed asses, in the machines. He goes, no, nope, no, nope, we're going to get them. And thank God he got them, because now uh, they're getting filled. And uh, the paragolfer really is for somebody who's got a disability where they can't use their feet. And um, there is nothing better that I love than being outside with my friends and in a beautiful place. So I want to thank DCR and Tom McCarthy for getting the machines. And uh, I really was surprised they're getting used now more often. Yeah, they're 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 really popular because um, it is like you said, it's a great way to get outdoors. I know I I know I spoke really fast. Um, I was trying to get through stuff, but I was um, I was thinking a lot of during um, Molly's presentation. Right. There's the benefit of exercise. There's also the benefit of doing it outdoors and just being outdoors and that social aspect, right? You can get out um, at our programs. We're doing things in groups. And then if, even if you're going out on your own and using the equipment, you can go golfing with your friends. You can go skating with your friends. Um, so it's a really great way to, to make that connection. So thank you again, Jerry, for, for bringing that up, showing those to Tom, because they're, they're a really great resource. Well, I tell everybody that I'm at the bottom of the Blue Hills. I mean, what could be better? There's deer running around. It's just beautiful being outside. And, uh, you know, I'm really glad DCR, the old MDC. See, I'm a lot older. I remember the MDC when it was that. But, uh, yeah, you guys do a great job. And I'd like to see more of us, more spinal cord people getting involved with DCR as much as possible. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. Thanks. Um, Ed. Uh, hi, hi, gang. Uh, yeah, Jerry, I remember the old MDC. Uh, as well, and the, the barracks over there at the, at the base of the Blue Hills. Um, Rachel, uh, my focus for the future is to be able to participate independently uh, in some of these activities. I'm amazed at the diversity of programs that you have available and look forward to taking advantage of some of them. My, my question to you is, uh, in leaning towards a more independent uh, pursuit, uh, cycling and, and specifically mountain biking uh, is my passion. But to go into a trail network and not know what is uh, open to an adaptive trike or, or what trails are, I'm capable of navigating, is there any... Uh, thought to introducing uh, a tra you know a, a marks markings on the trails um, or or in, in any of the areas to indicate that they're suitable for an independent athlete 
uh, to enjoy? That That is a great question. Um, and it's something we're actually working on right now. Marcy Markello is our recreation manager um, and she's working on a program for accessible trail signage. Um, the idea of um, accessible mountain biking trails is, gr is a great one. As Kathleen mentioned, um, that's sort of newer. It's fantastic to see they're doing that on the Cape. I don't think we've been thinking about that on our trails. So right, a lot of the mountain bike trails I'm thinking are pretty narrow because um, they're designed thinking for a bike. Um, I will have to look, I'm gonna talk to the GIS folks, the peeps who, people who do our mapping and see what information we have because we might be able to come up with ways to sit, say um, where you can go. Um, as in general, any if you've got your wheelchair um, anywhere that you can, you're allowed to take them on the trails, right? It's just a matter of do they fit? And the mountain bikes, um, again, I'm not a mountain biker, but I seen some of them, and I imagine they're they're pretty they're pretty narrow. Um, so is that is that the type of information you're looking for, like to make sure that it's wide enough? Um, again, I'm not a mountain biker, so sure. So I, I've been involved with uh, the Spalding adaptive mountain biking group down in the West Barnstable conservation area in uh, Marston Mills. And Terry Downey, who runs the program, just got a grant to install signage uh, throughout the trail network, indicating that you know this is an adaptive appropriate trail uh, for your use. And I think long term, if you could have uh, maps available or maybe uh, work with trail forks, which is the uh, mountain bikers go to uh, mapping application mm -hmm. uh, so that you could go to a trail network or plan a trip to a trail network and know that you had um, adaptive access uh, that you could get through gates. A lot of the fire roads, like in Wapatuck State Park, for instance, have gates across them. And if, if you encounter one of these obstacles and you can't get over, under, around, or through, uh, then you're turning around and or, or you're completely stymied. Uh, and yeah. I think Abby had a question. I don't. Sorry to interrupt. I think Abby's question. I know you have your hand raised. Was is on the lines of this. Yeah, that's that's a perfect intro to my question. You, um, DCR has just a, a lot of um, area that is potentially appropriate um, per, appropriate for adaptive use, not necessarily um, accessible um, in in ADA terms. Um, and so those who can um, uh, use mountain cycles and other um, sort of trail friendly equipment independently or with one companion. Um, are seeking exactly what Ed um, is asking for, some sort of um, chart of, you know, where they can expect to encounter um, few or no barriers. And um, we're also eager to um, help ensure that those um, ways are maintained. Um, you know, if you're in the woods, trees occasionally fall over mm -hmm. um, and we've had a hard time um, getting attention from DCR or the Friends of the Blue Hills um, to remove those barriers. I know you guys are chronically understaffed and underfunded, um, but it would be lovely if um, the, um, you know, the folks who control the budget for DCR could realize that some of the maintenance functions that they perform and consider routine are really critical um, to improve accessibility at your facilities. They, they really are. So we're, I mean, we're our separate or sort of our own separate program, right? The universal access program. But the majority of the access, and we hear this from folks, it's the park staff, right? The people that are there every day, keeping things open, keeping them cleared, um, letting people know, hey, here's an option. Um, are you looking to get here? I can tell you how to get here, that type of thing. So it is, it's nice to see we're really integrated into the agency. And I know a lot of folks at DCR, they're, they're really thinking about access um, while they're doing their job. And we just, be, we add on that, that extra thing on top. Um, I, I will say the trails piece, we're thinking about, we've realized um, we have a lot of resources out there that we don't 
have good representation of on our website. And a big one there is the trails. Our, we have a list of accessible trails, but it is not complete by any means. Um, and we're working on, there's this accessible trail signage project going on right now and thinking of ways to try and get, try and get that information out there for folks about what, what's already out there and what they can use, um, including a, um, an accessible trail Right, sort of rating system, letting people know what the conditions are so they can know what to expect. So like you said, Ed, you don't go out and then you get stuck at a gate halfway. Or if there is a gate, if there's some barrier, you know about it, and then you could plan your trip of, you know, do I want to do a half mile and half a mile back? Or do I want to go find a longer trail? So um, so thank you for that feedback. We are working on it. And um, if you want to reach out to me, we're looking for feedback, right, from hikers of, of what do you want in a rating system, what's helpful. Um, I will say, Ed, I don't think mountain biking hadn't been on my mind so it's really great that you bring that up too to make sure that we're thinking about that on the trails um, when we're coming up with these these systems so thanks thank you thank you um uh let's see ed ed you're muted Let, let me see if I can do something about that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I think it was Ra uh, Rachel, I think it was Abby that touched on uh, the reality that DCR as a, uh, a state agency is, is stretched pretty thin as far as budgets and, and manpower go. What can an end user like myself do uh, to help with that? That is a great question. That is very much a Tom question. Um, he would know the answer better than I would. I wish he was here. Um, but in general, I, I would say, um, I think getting in touch with the um, with your local representatives, right, your legislature, your rep, letting them know what you're using, what the barriers are, because I think that way they can know, um, it helps them know where the need is um, and, and how to how they can make sure that, um, that that everyone can access everything. As you said, right, as a state agency, our programs are all low or no cost, right? We're trying to make sure that everybody can get out there um, and we're working within the state budget. So yeah, getting in touch with, with your local reps would be a great idea. Thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah, so uh, Rachel, thanks for staying on a little bit later. Really appreciate it. Um, thanks to everybody who hung in there. Um, great questions, so much wonderful information. Uh, Molly and Kathleen had to drop off. Um, Mary is clapping. <laughs> it was terrific, really. Just um, amazing um, resources that are available in the area. So we hope people take advantage of it. And um, if you have questions, you know, we'll, we'll please reach out to me. I'm happy to connect you with any of our pre presenters from today. And we'll also, like I said, make sure that we get a list of um, these resources that we can just get out to everybody. So you have them at your, um, at your fingertips. So yeah, um, good to see you all. If anybody uh, get, get a few claps there. <laughs> um, next, next Thursday, we have just a open house zoom virtual Thanksgiving thing from 11 to 12. If anybody um, is around and wants to stop in and say, hello, we'll be there from 11 to 12. Um, and yeah, great to see everybody. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Thank you so much, Rachel. Great program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. Bye.